Chapter 1 The copter sat down in the front yard of the dragon nursery under a burning sun. The whirling blades raised such a dust storm, Jacken had to squint to see through the windows, and still the world outside seemed filled with sand and grit. Home! Aki sent Jacken the single word as they landed, her mind decorating the standing with a picture of the nursery, gray stone surrounded by red sky, which lay beyond the sand and grit. She pushed a strand of dark hair back from her forehead and pressed her face against the window. Home, Jacken answered, his sending the blue of the five rivers twisting through the tan sands. A cooler reaction, almost as if he were afraid. Only he wasn't afraid, just being cautious. It was an old habit, but a good one. As Golden's slim hands danced across the console of lights, the blade slowed, then stilled. Good landing, Golden said. Then he turned and grinned at them. Even if you two don't know the difference. Soon the dust settled. A minute more and Jacken could see through the grit that the landscape was neither as red or gray, or as tan and blue, as their sendings. Aki laughed, a soft, delightful sound, and Jacken was reminded of other times she sounded like that. Not many recently, hardly any when they were on the run in the mountains, and none at all in the cave with the trogs. But he remembered them all. Overhead, Heart's Bloods Five, Sargon, Sasha, Triss, Trisha, and Trisket wheeled away, disappearing behind a cluster of trees. In his mind, Jack and heard them bidding a goodbye, their sendings as bright and fluffy as clouds. Sargon goes, Sargon flies high, sent the largest and only male. As ever, his sendings were full of himself, and full of what he was doing now. Dragon time was always now. They could remember a trainer, their hatchlings, their nest. They could be taught enough movements to fight warily in a pit. They could recall where a particularly fine patch of wart existed, but otherwise they lived in the now. Still, they'd been able to hold on to enough to bring Golden to the rescue, to guide him to where Jacken and Aki had been on the run from the trogs who slaughtered dragons in their caves. Thanks, my friends. Jacken's sending to the dragons was open-ended, brightly colored. Those dragons were the one constant in Jacken's life, besides Aki. He hoped they weren't going far. They linked his past and present, sky and earth, nursery and the wilds. Good flying, my friends. They were behind the trees, so he couldn't see them any more, couldn't hear them either. But just in case, he called out again with his mind. Fair wind. A sunny image flitted back to him, actually more like a brain tickle. So at least one of them heard. Probably Sasha, always the sunny one. Here we are, Golden said, flicking the last switches on the console. Turning his head, he nodded at Jack and Anaki, his river-colored eyes glinting at them. Oh, the nursery, back where your life begins. It was unclear if he was making a joke or a simple statement. Jacken had never been able to read Golden easily, and unlike the dragon's minds, Golden's was closed. Of course, Jacken knew that humans had closed minds, but it was something he would have to get used to now that they were back. Back home. Unbuckling his seatbelt, Golden stood and stretched. Walking to the copter door, he pushed it open, then flicked a switch that unfolded a set of stairs. Descending the steps backward, he signaled Jacken and Aki to follow the same way. As Jacken climbed down from the copter, he looked over his shoulder. The shock of it all, gates, wood and stone walls, dusty yard, and the blue water in the weir, seemed overwhelmingly like a dream, so self-contained, so comfortable, so familiar. He and Aki had been living for a year as outlaws, exiles, running, hiding, afraid all the time. Well, maybe not all of the time, but a lot of the time. Living in caves without real beds, worrying about where their next meal would come from. How often he had dreamed about coming home to the nursery, but he never really believed it would ever happen. Too many people with too many grievances were still looking for them. Like the Ostar wardens who wanted to put them in jail, the rebels who wanted to kill them outright. Yet, according to Golden, all that was no longer true. At least the rebels were satisfied, the wardens too. Jack and set his lips together. Not that he mistrusted Golden, but it seemed too good to be. Now, of course, they had another problem. The trogs in the caves probably wanted Jacken and Aki dead, because they didn't want the secret of their caves to come out. And they probably wanted their two dragons back as well. I regret none of that, Jacken thought. None. And none of the past year, either. Oh, it had been a hard year. But, though hard, life in the mountains had given Jacken and Aki a taste for freedom. He mulled that over. A taste for freedom. He hadn't realized he'd sent it till Aki answered him. And a hunger for home. Jacken nodded. Many times he'd been sure they would die up in the mountains, with only heart's blood's hatchlings to mourn them. And Sargon to comment on it all. This time there was a bubbling laugh in Aki's sending. 
But home, he never really believed they could return. Reaching solid ground, Jack in turn, then stared at the dragon nursery. Without realizing what he was doing, he rubbed the thin bracelet of scar tissue on his wrist. The whole of that year in the mountains, he tried to keep his deepest longings for the nursery shielded so that Aki couldn't read his heartache and add it to her own. Now that they were actually back, he felt he should be elated. What he actually felt was... Scared? Aki's sending was tentative, wavery, like the water at the bottom of the falls. Stay out of my mind, he answered, with black and gold arrow points, sharper than he meant. To soften it, he turned back and reached a hand up to help her down, for she was facing forward as she came down the steps, carefully cradling the young dragon hatchling. Its back and belly were still patchworked with the last of its gray egg skin, and it looped its tail securely around her wrist. Thanks, she whispered to Jacken, and smiled, a tremulous, tentative smile. It said even more than her sending. Yeah. This time, the sending was not Aki's. Anxiously, Jacken looked around. Finally, he spotted the sender, Oracle, the pale red adult dragon they'd brought out of the caves before she could be sacrificed by the trogs. She was crouched on the far side of the nursery yard, tail twitching. Not one of Hart's blood's brood. She was possibly a cousin, for her color and sendings were reminiscent of the red dragons. He and Aki had gotten her out of the caves just in time, into the air, showed her that she could fly, that she could be free. Oracle's neck arched downward and her neck scales fluttered, which meant that any moment she might bolt. It's astonishing that she's landed here and not actually flown off with the others, Jacken thought. In her mind, men were not safe. Not even her rescuers. Not Aki. Not me. Here? Jacken hadn't meant to send the question, blue and stuttering, but Oracle caught a glimpse of it anyway. Here. She answered in the same color, but even more faded. The membranes on her eyes closed, effectively shuttering them. Jacken's thoughts followed one another in quick succession. Oracle was probably here because she wasn't used to flying, having been kept in that underground prison the whole of her life, except for the one time when she was bred. Or perhaps she was here because Aki had the dragon ring. Or because she was exhausted. Or because she was... Scared. Gentle Oracle. This time, Jacken's blue sending was edged about with soft beige billows. Do not be afraid. We are with thee. Soon thee will be altogether safe. Dragon masters of the nursery always spoke that way to their charges. Thee and thou. Jacken didn't know why. It was just how things were done. And it certainly calmed them down. Oracle lifted her head slightly. Her eyes were dark, but without the fire of a fighting dragon. Even if she hadn't sent her fear to him, he would have known it by her posture. The crouch, the lashing tail, the shuttered eyes. She was afraid of the copter, of the nursery, of the memory of the trogs. Well, she had a right to be afraid of the trogs. I'm afraid of them, too. Jackin! Aki's voice gave a warning. He thought she meant he was broadcasting his own fear to the terrified oracle, but Aki was pointing in a different direction. He turned, caught something out of the corner of his eye, and startled, before realizing that the door of the bond house had flown open. Out ran the fat cook, Karina, though it was more like a fast waddle. Her haste was understandable. Any copter was a rare sight at the nursery. Usually the appearance of one meant bad news. Wiping her hands nervously on her long apron, Karina stared at Golden, who was standing several steps away from the copter's blades. Her hands left dark red stains on the white cloth of her apron, stains that could have been either tack or blood. Jacken licked his lips, just thinking about a cup of tack, that tasted a sudden, vivid recollection in his mouth. After a year of drinking boil, that thin soup made from greasy skag grass, he was more than ready for tack. A whole pot of it. Two whole pots of it. And then he remembered what it was made of. Dragon's blood. It's back to boil, he said to Aki, at the same time including a picture of him bathing in a pot of the gray-green stuff. Aki broke into sudden, nervous laughter. Hearing Aki's laugh, Karina gasped, her face an alarming crimson. She returned and finally registered who Golden's passengers were. Without warning, she burst into tears and threw her apron up over her head. Karina, Aki said with a sweetness Jacken hadn't heard from her in a while. Kay, it's me. That sent the old woman to crying even harder. Still sobbing, the cook lowered her apron, waddled up to them, and gathered up Aki and Jacken in her massive arms, which threatened to break bones and bring bruises. Karina smelled of fresh bread and sharp tack, and something burnt. She smelled of home. His knees suddenly buckled. Home. Oh, 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 Karina said over and over. Oh, oh, without letting go of either of them. At last, Aki cried out, Karina, you're crushing me in the dragonling. It was true. The old cook had enfolded all three of them in her hard embrace. Jacken was incapable of speech. Oh, oh, oh. 
Karina said one more time, then let them go. Again, out of the corner of his eye, Jack saw movement, this time on his right. He stepped in front of Aki, to shield her, before realizing it was only old Balak, the plowman, coming in from the fields. Next to him was Trico, with someone else, a moon-faced boy with stringy blonde hair whom Jacken didn't recognize. Balak had spotted the copter, then Jacken and Aki, and began complaining even before he was close. They had to strain to hear him. All those days of mourning, he started, and me hardly able to work, thinking about you two dead up there in the mountains in the cold. Little Jack and little Aki. Though, of course, neither of them had been little, then or now. Indeed, they hadn't been little for quite some time. And, of course, neither of them had been dead, though how was poor Balak to have known? Jack and stared at Balak's moon-faced companion, wondering who he was, how he'd gotten to the nursery. Of course, a year was a long time to be away. People could die, move to the city, be sent off-world. People could grow old, forgetful, take on new apprentices. People could change. We apologize for being both alive and well, Aki said, but with a smile to take away the sting of it. The dragonling resettled itself, curling up so tightly in Aki's arms, it was almost a dragon ball. At this point, it seemed to regard Aki as its mother. That would be funny, Jacken thought, if it weren't so... so inconvenient. The hatchling had imprinted on Aki early, and refused to be parted from her. Trico winked at Jacken, as if to say the year away had simply been a ploy to be alone with Aki. But then Trico's mind always works that way, from the slightly off-color to the positively filthy. He couldn't, Jacken thought, understand real love. But looking confused, Balak turned to Golden, spread his hands, palms to the sky. His new helper touched his arm, as if in comfort. At the same time, a roar from the stud barn made them all turn around. A male dragon, sensing roiling emotion nearby, was simply trying to bring the attention to himself. It was an old dragon trick, and, as usual, it worked. Typical male, Aki said with an exaggerated eye roll, which broke the tension, and they all laughed, even Jacken. Only Oracle still seemed perturbed. Her sending to Jacken was laced with red spots that looked a great deal like blood. Danger? No danger, he answered soothingly. How? Karina asked, meaning how are they still alive? What? Where? Balak added, waving a hand. Trigo's knowing smile spread slowly across his face. The answers to any of those questions had to be given carefully, guardedly, because there was danger, great danger, even if he'd just assured Oracle that there was none. He and Aki had to be certain that they said the same things, that their versions of the past year's adventures matched exactly. If not, the future of all the dragons on Ostar Four could be a bloody one indeed. If the secret gets out, our secret, he thought, adding, Aki, take care. I'm not stupid, she shot back, the red lightning bolt accompanying it. "'lancing through his mind with such force, he almost winced. "'But there's no way it can get out unless you tell. "'Me? I'm silent as the grave.' "'Facing him directly, so that no one else could see, "'she lifted her hand to her mouth, "'then surreptitiously drew her finger across her throat. "'See? Dead. Grave. Got it?' "'Afterward, she smiled broadly at Karina, "'at Balak and his helper, at Golden, even at Trico. First, showers, food, rest. Then we'll tell you all.' "'All?' The picture Jack had sent was a frantic, dark red, roiling cloud. We'll only tell them what we want to, silly, she soothed, her sending shot through with a golden light. But we'll tell them that it's all. And he was soothed. They would find their way through this difficult place together, keeping secret how they'd sheltered in Heart's Blood's birth cavity as she lay dying, keeping secret that they'd emerged with dragon ears and eyes, and a dragon's brave heart as well, keeping secret their astonishing ability to speak mind to mind. They'd keep all the secrets safe. And that way, keep all the dragons safe, too. Because if the people of Ostar find all this out, they won't stop to think that it's only hens who'd recently given birth who can give them the dragon gifts. Most Ostarians don't know a female dragon from a male. They'd probably slaughter all the dragons, just in case. Jack and Shiver. He couldn't let that happen. What's this? What's this babble? An old man pushed his way through the knot of nursery folk. His sharp, ravaged face fell when he saw Jack and his one good eye staring. Though whether it was shock or disappointment, Jacken couldn't tell, because the man's eyes immediately seemed to shudder, like a dragon's. Hello, Golden said. Look what I found. His voice was bright, as if he were enjoying a vast joke. It's little Aki, little Jacken, Balak explained. Of course it's them, the old man retorted. Any piece of worm's bit can see that. At that, any good memories of Lacarn helping them escape a year ago into the mountains left Jacken and he felt a returning rush of dislike for the man. 
Karina collapsed into sobs again. Well, here's a welcome home, Lacarn said. Oh, you'll find us all changed. You can tell us why you're alive later. We've still got a day's work to finish. It was more a slap in the face than a welcome home, and Jack had almost said something, but Aki sent him a picture of his head going under a cold tap. Just stay cool. She's right, of course. No need to fight with old Lickenspittle now. After all, he did owe the old man something for helping them escape from the wardens. So, instead, he said in what he hoped was a cozening voice, We found a new dragon, Lacarn. Maybe related to our dragons. Her color is interesting, at any rate. Could she have been sired by one of our escaped males? Lacarn said nothing. We thought we could... Jacken stopped, thinking that he'd be damned if he would bed. Oi! Lacarn was not going to help one bit. Aki and me. You remember Aki. Master Sarkhan's only child. Jacken was losing his temper again, and even ascending from Aki, showering him with a waterfall of cold water didn't slow him down. She probably owns a nursery now that her father's dead. Balak said, No, no, no. And Karina added, We all own it! Lacarn smiled slowly. I was the only one mentioned in Zargan's will, boy. He knew Aki didn't want the place, and I was the only one to run it. I now own half. The rest I've given to the nursery folk. Time served, you know. But he didn't know, and Jackin's face showed it. He touched the dimple on his cheek, a sure sign he was upset. If I'd been a young dragon in the pit, I'd have been down on my knees in front of the older, slyer dragon by now, the two ritual slashes across my throat. So, will you let us board her here? It was Aki, the little dragon carried in the crook of her arm. And this little one as well? Lacarn laughed, and though it didn't have a particularly happy sound, it was clear he'd given in. You've always been able to get around me, young lady. Welcome home. Noticing no welcome home for him, Jackin thought about getting another mental dunking from Aki if he said anything. He didn't want that, so he let his anger go. Aki can shower first. Jackin told Lacarn, Karina, Balak, the boy. He ignored Trico. I need to get Oracle settled in. It was only then that the others even seemed to notice the pale dragon crouched by the side of the wall. Bagsdall, keep her away from the rest of the nursery dragons for now. Lacarn said, as if I didn't know that. Take the hatchling, too! Aki handed the ball of dragon over to him. The minute he touched it, the hatchling uncurled in his hand, its tail now anchored firmly around his wrist, and looked longingly back at Aki. Or, Jackin thought, as longingly as a dragon can look. Aki sent a bright orange warning. No more sendings! Not when we're close enough to speak! We might make people suspicious! The color was flame-shaped. You look different when you're sending to me. Your eyes get all squinty and you stare at me with great concentration. I bet I do the same. Jack and nodded. He tried not to stare, hoping that it looked as if he were simply agreeing to take the hatchling, which he was. But he was also nodding to Aki about the sendings. Not that Golden, Karina, Lacarn, and the rest of them could know that. After all, they couldn't hear the sendings or see the colors. Yes, Jack and said aloud. No more sendings, he added in ascending, looking away so he didn't stare at Aki. Not this close. Golden took Jacken and Aki by the arms and pulled them aside, giving them a hug. Better to say, better to say too little than too much until I've figured out the ramifications of your rescue. Ramifications? Jacken asked. To us or to you? Aki added. To us, star, of course, Golden said. Then he stepped back from them and waved his hands vaguely, as if he were campaigning for something. Karina turned to Golden. You'll be staying to dinner, of course, she twinkled at him. He smiled regretfully. You're my favorite cook, Kay, but I've too much work back in the city. There's a Senate race going on in the rope. I've got competition this time. He turned and ran back up the steps to the copter. Flatterer! Karina called back, and then Golden was gone, through the copter door, and moments later, the rotor started up again. Karina turned to Aki and enveloped her again, as if determined to shelter Aki from the sand and grit the copter was throwing around, as if she could shelter her from the world. Over Aki's head, Karina said to Jackin, Tell us what you want, what you need. You must be exhausted. A year, a year, and now you're home where you belong. Who would believe it? She began to sniffle loudly as she led Aki away into the bondhouse. The door snicked shut behind them.